I'm excited about this morning. I had, I had a, a message planned and prepared, and, and uh, it was coming from Joel 2.32, and it was in the vein of deliverance. I love the scripture. It says, who shall ever call upon my name shall be saved. Then it goes on to say, deliverance is therefore of the remnant, is what the verse says in Joel 2. And so, I, you know, I'm like, this sounds deliverance and remnant, and this all works. And I was in worship last night, and the Holy Spirit said, don't teach on that. Teach on grace. And I said, okay, let's get after it. And uh, so this morning, the title of my message is Remnant of Grace. Romans 11.5 says, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, we declare that your word's true and every man's a liar. Father, we declare that your word is the highest authority. It's not our job to get the word to align with us. It's our job to align with the word. So we submit to it this day. Father, I thank you right now that you are preparing minds to, to, to receive, ears to hear, hearts to receive what your spirit is saying. So I ask you to replace my words with yours, Lord. Father, I thank you that I stand at this great pulpit and I ask your spirit to speak through me. Jesus, this is your place. This is your pulpit. This is your church. We're your people. I'm your servant. Have your way in this place. Be made famous, God. And we thank you for your wonderful true grace. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said amen, amen. and amen. If I was honest, I, 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 this is only the second time in my last 15 years of ministry that I've taught on grace. I've shied away from grace, and it's become a very, very popular message. Are we live streaming? I'm going to come down. Is that okay? We're going to mess it all up. I'm getting out of the light. Ruin it for you. I'm a TV guy. So the moment you come over here out of the light, the picture's just horrible. But I've shied away from teaching on grace and uh, the reason why, it's because it's become the go-to fad popular message. Everyone and their mother is preaching about grace, and there's a new definition of grace every other week. We start calling grace the fourth member of the Trinity and all these different things, and it, it gets, it's just getting weird. And, and, and it's, it's so popular, and I, I'm watching young, young ministers and youth pastors that I get to mentor and young adult pastors that I get to speak into their lives. They're, 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 they're regurgitating podcasts and repeating what other people are saying and, and, and haven't gone and, and studied and looked and read for themselves what true grace is. And it's unfortunate because the truth is, is grace is a wonderful thing. We are saved by faith and grace alone. I mean, that's how we are saved. And it, it, so it's an undeniable uh, part of our salvation in our relationship with God. But, but the Bible gives clear warnings on the abuse of grace and what will happen when grace is being taught incorrectly. And that's what's happening in our nation is grace is being taught incorrectly. And so because it's so popular and because it, it, it's become almost a fad that, that everyone's on the bandwagon. So I just kind of got away from it and said, you know, I'm just I'm going to preach righteousness. I'm going to talk about the kingdom. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what the Lord's called me to do. And I'm, I'll let everybody else copy each other. Until I, I tell studying righteousness, I couldn't get away from grace because the Bible says that grace reigns in righteousness. So you, you, you can't you can't separate them. So. What I'm going to do today is, and I was, I was just stirred last, I was in worship, and, and, and the Holy Spirit said, teach on grace tomorrow. And then I hear Pastor Pat get up and declare Romans 11:5. 5, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Who's saying that? Paul's saying that in a time of very heated times. This is the time where many are rejecting Jesus, many are, are falling away. Uh, this is the time where, 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 where it's intense to be a true Christian, a true believer. It likens the day in, in 1 Kings 19 where, where Elijah is confronting the, the 750 prophets of Baal and the 700 prophets of Asherah. This is the, 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 the time where he's confronting them and, and, and this is the time where he's crying out to God and, and, and saying, I feel like I'm the only one left. I, I feel like I'm the only one standing for righteousness. I feel like I'm the only one who hasn't compromised. I, I, I feel like I'm the last of the remnant. And I want to warn you of thinking like that. Because every time we think like that, or every time someone in the Word thinks like that, God quickly corrects them. And like he said to, to Elijah, he's saying to us now, no, 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 you're not the only ones, I promise you. You're not the only ones who pr are praying and fasting. There, there's 15,000 right now on the 21-day challenge. There's pockets around the globe. There's pockets around the world. And the fact even to think that is a complete lack of humility. And God quickly rebukes the prophet 
And he says to him, I have yet in reserve 7,000 men of Israel whose knees haven't bowed to Baal and whose mouths haven't kissed him. That has not given in to the world's temptations or given in to the, the luxuries of life. This is what he said to the prophet. This is what the apostle Paul was saying to us. And I believe that God's grace is wants to revisit America in a brand new way, but in a righteous way. And today I want to teach on what is true grace. Grace is used in the Bible 277 different times. Ephesians 2, 4 says this, but because of his great love for us, God is so rich in his mercy, he made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that we have been saved. Verse 8, for it is by grace that you've been saved. Through faith, it's not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. So what is grace? If we're looking at in the Greek, uh, it means this a leaning towards or used for the favor of the Lord. It's God freely extending or giving himself away to people or leaning towards them. It's God completely chasing after them. God's grace means he's going after us, but we've made it only about God's grace going after us and not our response to his grace. Turning back to God. In the Hebrew, it means this extending towards or reaching towards. God's disposition to bless people. I love what A.M. Hunter says. He says, grace is free, forgiving, love of Christ to sinners. So let's talk about grace for a second. Who's in need of grace? We are all in need of grace. Ephesians 2, 5, I just wrote, read it. We are dead in our transgressions, but by grace that we're saved. Verse 4, we are saved through grace by faith. It says, or it is by grace you have been saved, Ephesians 2, 4 says. Acts 15, 11, it says, we believe it through grace, the Lord Jesus, that we are saved just as they are. Again, we are under grace, we're not under the law. First Romans 6, 14, it says, for sin shall no longer be your master. You are not under the law, you are under grace. What does that mean? It means that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So it's grace through Jesus. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to say. If you're taking notes, write this down. You, you will understand the full understanding of grace only through Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, is Jesus is not only grace, but he's truth. Let me say that again. Jesus is not only grace, but he's truth. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made a dwelling among us. We have seen in the glory, in the glory of the one only son, who became the father, full of grace with truth. See, we must treat, teach truth and grace together if we just have truth you'll be in legalism if you just tr preach grace you'll end up in carnality they must be preached coincidingly they must be preached together because here's the thing is grace without truth is deception pastor pat told me in the back room before we began he said his his mentor reinhardt bunke says uh give me Grace without repentance is religion. Powerful. We must preach grace and truth at the same time. Jude 1, 4. You ready for this? We're going to get after it. How many love God's word? It says this, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God, watch, into a license for immorality, and they deny Jesus Christ, our sovereign Lord. That's pretty heavy, right? It says they have secretly slipped in on, among you. Do you know what that means? Is that you don't see them coming because it sounds good. Can I just tell you right now that everything that sounds good isn't God? Everything that sounds like God might be Oprah. You ever see an Oprah favorite things episode? Looks a whole lot like a revival service, doesn't it? People jumping, shouting, screaming, talking all sorts of language, fighting over gifts. <laughs> so what happens is, 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 is she'll, we'll, we'll bring world leaders onto a program and talk to Christian leaders. And, and oh, wow, she's talking to Christian leaders. And then they'll bring secular, heathenistic, uh, anti-loving Jesus leaders on there. And oh, that sounds good too. 
Everything that's good is not God. So just because they say the right words, listen, does not mean it's of God. Let me give you an example. There was a, a, a woman who was following, was it Peter or Paul? I, I, don't, I don't remember. She was following, was it Paul? Paul. She's following Paul and, and, and Paul's ministering every day. And, and, and she's saying, these men are from God. These men are from God. These men are anointed. And listen to him. And Paul gets so irritated. He turns around and casts the devil out of her. Now, hold on a second. It's all she's doing is saying, pastor, that was the best sermon I've ever heard in my life. These are so, Pastor, that was so good. Amen, Pastor. Way to go. This is God. This is awesome. And he turns around and he casts it out of her. Why did he do that? Because Paul was about to leave town and go to the next city. And he didn't want any people turning around and thinking that she was full of God because she was saying good things. See, see, that's what the gift of discernment. Father, give us the gift of discernment back to the church. Listen, we don't, I feel the Holy Spirit. I love preaching here, Pastor Paul. We don't have the gift of discernment anymore because we've kicked out the Holy Spirit because we don't like tongues. So we've grieved the Holy Spirit because we don't understand speaking in tongues. So then we want someone to give an interpretation every time they speak in tongues when that's not biblical. If you're prophesying in tongues, you're going to need interpretation because no one knows what the heck you're saying. But, it, but Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. Or, or it's, it's a daily building yourself up, a praying without ceasing. Let me tell you, every time, almost about, not every time, about 99% of the time when I hear God I make, like, from heaven speak to me and alter the course of my life, it's when I'm praying in my prayer language. I was in Austin, Texas, and I was on a prayer walk, and I was just praying in the Spirit, and, and that's when the Lord spoke to me. It was on October morning when the Lord spoke to me and said, 2014 is a year of righteousness. And every time I need a word from God, it's coming when I'm praying in the Spirit. We need discernment in the house of God. We need, we need all the gifts in the house of God. So the... We have to know the difference between what's good and what's God. So, so they're slipping in among us, and we don't notice them. Why don't we notice them? Because they might have already established ministries. So we say stupid stuff, and I like preaching here because I could be me. We say stupid stuff like, well, look at their fruit. And I would say to you, why don't you look at their kids? No, no, before you look at the size of their church, no, 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 no. Look at their second marriage. Praise the Lord. I feel the anointing in here. Before, before you're flattered with their television show, they, almost everything on there is fake anyway. That's right. Come on. Oh, it's fake trees. It's fake makeup. Fake nail. Fake every. It's fake. It ain't real. Before you're uh, so, so flattered by their success, and then we say, man, look at that success, that's fruit. You know what the Holy Spirit spoke to me? He said, you're calling all these things fruit, fruit, because you have known, so you have to substitute. Wow. See, the only thing the Bible calls fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Oh, so you have an international ministry, but you're a jerk behind the scenes. Where's the fruit? Come on, somebody. Or the, or, or the, the Lord's moving you to a new direction every other month and, 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 and there's no faithfulness in your life. Come on, we, we need to have real fruit, but we're not gonna have real fruit if we're not people of the word. See, people of the flesh are impressed by crowds. People of the flesh are impressed by television shows. People of the flesh are impressed by things that shiny and glitter. We gotta be people of the spirit. Okay, this, listen, this is so important. If you're taking notes, write this down. Heresy is when we take a half truth and make it a full truth. We don't use, my generation doesn't use words like heresy because we're all under grace and everything goes. So we want to be friends with everybody. We want followers. We want, we want friends on Facebook and, and we want everybody to like us. So, so we, want to, we, we never want to contradict anything and then just people, just every, everything goes. Well, everything doesn't go with God. Everything doesn't fly with God. Heresy is when you take a half truth and make it a full truth. So deception is being taught. And I want to talk about one of the main deceptions that's being taught. And I just want you to be aware of it. I'm not calling out names. I won't talk about any person. I'm just talking about what's untruthful according to the word of God. And here's one of the main things that I hear taught. And it's so dangerous. And this is what is, it, it, it's, it's, it's truly what the remnant is being forged from. That's right. And it's this here. It's that your 
future sins are forgiven. Now, let's just break this down for a second because it sounds good. It sounds God. In fact, there's, there's, there's full denominations and groups, and I'm sure there's already people upset right now because I can, I can feel it already. Just, I can feel it just uncovered. Who's that young kid with that hair? <laughs> so here's what it sounds like. It sounds like, well, well you, you come to Jesus and you give your life to the Lord and there's, there's a, a, a great exchange. He, he changes your unrighteousness. You give him your unrighteousness. He gives you his righteousness and that's the great exchange and, and you're brought into the kingdom of God. And, 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 and then I, I hear preachers preach it like this. Like, well, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. And when he died on the cross 2,000 years ago, you weren't even alive. And so all of your sins are future sins. And so, and so if you got saved now or a year from now or, 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 or months from now, or, or, or it, you know, it, it doesn't really matter what you do because God's grace covers everything. So I want to talk about that. So Colossians 2.13 says this, When you were dead in transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven all of our transgressions, having canceled our, out the certificate of debt, someone shout debt, and consists of, of decrees against us, which were hostile to us. He has taken out every way, nailing it to the cross. Now, this is a great youth ministry scripture because every youth minister or, you know, if you've grown up in church or been in church for a couple of years, you know, you've had to have some kind of camp, some kind of encounter, some kind of conference where they got an old wooden cross up there and they got a bucket of nails and every kid in the place writes down their, their sins, their thing on a piece of paper, right? And we all go up and we nail it to the cross. Come on, don't, how many have done this at some point? Okay, look, look at that, everybody, y'all are just godly people. And so we, we, we did this, we nailed it and you know, we cried and snot came down and you know, I crucified you. Jesus. And we did all of that. But here's the thing. I've been, I've been in youth and young adult ministry for over 15 years. And in 15 years, I have not one, I've not had one time, one kid in one camp conferences of the hundreds I've been a part of ever one time come up to me and say, hey, Landon, uh, is it okay if I write down this future sin? I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to do it. Come on. It's, it's they take their sins. And so we just slip it in there, past, present, and future. Whoa, 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 whoa. It sounds good. And there's, there's scriptures that, that, that can apply to, to, the, to the untrained ear or the untrained eye or the, the undisciplined disciple that it sounds right. But, but let me assure you it's not God. So when it says that Jesus, the word, keep the scripture up, it says that he had canceled our debt. See, here's the thing, is debt is something that you have already racked up. Debt is something, watch, that you've accumulated. But it's not future. If you had somebody that comes to you and say, hey, I just want to bless you. I want to cancel all of your debt. I want to pay your debt. How many would say, thank you, Lord? And then on top of that, look at When they say, I want to cancel your debt, no one would think your future debt. You mean what I've accumulated up to this point. Let me give you a couple more scriptures. Debt was canceled at repentance of sin. John chapter 1 verse 9, it says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. And he cleanses us of all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I'm going to say this, and this is bold, but there's not one single scripture that refers to forgiveness of future sins. I love when people say, well, well you know, I heard this, and I, I always respond to them, okay, cool, show me in the word. Pastor, I heard we can tithe our time. Great, show me the scripture that says that. I heard hearing's a problem, reading is, is a little better. There's not one single I love what the, the Remnant Manifesto says. It says, the remnant have found freedom in the arms of a loving Savior who have not only forgiven us of their past, but watch, now has authority over your future. Yeah. See, when, when we're, tr we're trying to take authority over our future when we are trying to get sins forgiven in the future. Rather than allowing the true grace of God to come upon our lives to empower us so that we're not sinning in the future. 
I love what my mentor, Dr. Brown, says. Forgiveness is prepaid, but not applied in advance. In fact, what they're talking about, forgiveness of future sins, the Bible actually talks about it from the opposite perspective. Pastor Pat and I were talking about this in the back room. Titus 2.11, put it up on the screens. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Someone say all people. Watch this. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Can I use this remnant towel or is that like a holy grail? Okay, I didn't want to, didn't want to ruin the future altar calls or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> this leather is a little sweaty. It says this, grace teaches us to say no. So why is all this grace teaching teaching you to say yes? If it's teaching you to say yes to sin, it's not grace. It's what the word warned us of us, that deception has snuck in among you and it has perverted the spirit of grace for a license of immorality. Let me hear you. Listen, whenever sexuality is being encouraged and promoted, I'm telling you, it's not from our holy God. There's only one word that begins to describe God when he described himself in his own spirit. There's no word that can describe God, but the only word that comes close is holy. Pay attention when you read the word, even when Jesus said, when you begin to pray, declare this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know what he's saying? Is declare who he is. He's a holy God. If you start out your prayer time declaring his holiness rather than asking for stuff, you have personal revival in your life. So there's there's this pushing, there's this advancing of perversion and grace of God is sneaked right into the whole thing. And then if you ever want to keep somebody accountable or stand up for God's word, then they say stuff like, well, you're just judging. Well, you without sin cast the first stone. Well, keep reading the Bible. Then Jesus told her to go and sin no more. So what you mean to say is I don't want any accountability in my life. What you mean to say is I don't want to be a true disciple. What you really mean is I don't want to live according to God's word. It says this. Put that scripture back up. It teaches us. To say no. See, I, I wasn't, I, and I'm 31 years old. So I, I, I'm not 40s, I'm not in my 50s, and, and I, I wasn't raised in a religious church where everything was sin and everything was the devil. I was raised in the presence of God. I was raised in, in, in meetings with Reinhardt and, 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 and Rodney Howard Brown and revival and the Spirit of God. That's what I grew up in. So I didn't grow up in the religious sect. So I understand that, that there's been this pendulum swing from, from religious behavior that people are saying, okay, we don't want to be religious anymore. But then we can come in the wrong direction of that pendulum and we could become carnal. So holiness is not wearing a skirt down to your ankles or never wearing, wearing makeup. Okay, I promise you every one of those guys on TV are wearing makeup, even the dudes. <laughs> holiness... Is a lifestyle before the Lord. A lifestyle that says no. A lifestyle that says no to sin. Young people, you need to get this in your spirit. You need to have a no to the things that are of this world. A no to ungodly things, worldly passions. In fact, it's interesting. Because as you hear the grace message being manipulated over and over and over, you'll hear the teaching on that you don't need repentance. In fact, I've actually, in the last few months, seen some of my contemporaries on social media, other other youth ministers, tell people that you don't have to go to the altar over and over. You've already been saved. You don't need to be saved five times. Maybe they weren't saved the first time. Can I read your scripture on that? Let me read this. I'm going to jump out of... Where is that? I'm going out of order, PowerPoint people. First John 3. You ready for this? Let's talk about this. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that you may take away our sins. And to him, it is no sin. Verse 6. Watch this. This is so powerful. Is it up on the screen? You're looking at this? 
no one who keeps sinning lives in him. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, this is just a Bible verse. That's all, this is just a Bible verse. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. Don't let anyone lead you astray. I know, I know that they have 100,000 followers on Twitter. Don't let them lead you astray. I know that they're preaching at every camp and conference around the country. Don't let them lead you astray. I know that you're friends with them. What happens when your friends go astray? No one continues to sin, has either seen him or know him. Don't let him lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Let me read that again. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Look at verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Because God's uh, seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning. But the one who has been born of God. Verse 10. This is how we know who is a child from God. And who are children of the devil. Come on. That's intense. So. With, with an abuse of grace. Watch you have to begin to remove more biblical truths. So they start saying stuff like, you don't have to repent, you've already repented. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. I was on a phone call with a a ministry that had one of the nation's largest ministry to homosexuals. And uh, I I have a a passion in a heart to see my generation set free. And uh, I, I know that as soon as you get out and start saying this stuff, you're judgmental and hateful and biblical and all those things. But, but uh, I, I, I could care less. And I'm, I'm writing a book right now on homosexuality. It'll be out next year. And I had world leaders take me aside and say, Land, I'm worried about you. You, you know, you're writing a book on Jezebel and now homosexuality. I don't want you to be one of those guys, you know. You, you know, your reputation's at stake. And I responded to all of them the same way. I'm like, no, 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 a generation's at stake. And, and so I, I reached out to one of, this, the, one of the nation's largest ministries to homosexuals and it took me a while and we're talking about doing TV shows and telling testimonies and different things and finally got on the phone with the president of the, the company and you know, we're talking and I'm sharing my heart and I just kept feeling this resistance on the phone. It's just, he's like, Landon, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. He's like, you're using some terms that we don't really use around here. I'm like, what? Like Bible words? What? And he said, he said, no, 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 you know, you're using confront and warfare and principalities and devil. And he's like, you know, we don't, we don't really do that. He's like, we don't actually promote heterosexuality or homosexuality. I'm like, really? What do you promote? And he goes, well, we, we promote a holy lifestyle. I'm like, great. How do you do that? And I said, I said, you know what? I've never had this opportunity. Let me start asking you some questions. I just asked him some biblical questions. And, and, and he, his, his responses were so weird to these questions. Yeah. And, and, and I, said, I, said, I said, well, well explain to me something. I said, if you have someone who's continually living a lifestyle, and Paul teaches about confronting your brother, bringing him in front of two or three witnesses, bringing him from the church, excuse me, Jesus does, and then excommunicating them. That's what Jesus teaching. Paul reaffirmed it. This is what we're supposed to do. And I know everybody's offended they got kicked out of his church because they were so rebellious and went, back, went, went, went submit. But anyway, so, so I said, what do you do in this circumstance that Jesus taught? And here's what he said to me. He goes, Landon, there's a difference between good news and good advice. I was like, red flag. And I said, sir, I said, then who determines what's good news and what's good advice? And he said, well, that's where grace comes in. See, that's, that's the lie. The lie is that we get to abandon the word of God and grace comes in. The truth is, is we receive the word of God and grace comes in. We're out of time, so I need to start wrapping this up. So, so, So let's talk about repentance, okay? It's interesting because all of the prophets... Moses, Jesus, Peter, Paul, Timothy, everyone. Do you know what their ministry was? John the Baptist. Do you know what their ministry was? 
Do you know what their, 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 their theme was every year? Let me tell you, repentance. Oh, in fact, it's crazy because even when Jesus taught us how to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our, isn't that interesting? But we don't need to repent, but Jesus said, when you're praying, this is how you should be praying. Matthew 4, Jesus begins his ministry in verse 4. So he just leads the wilderness path. He's tempted by the devil. He comes out of the, uh, the desert, messing with the devil. And, 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 and what does he preach? Verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven as hand. I'm going to break something. You have all of these people saying, I'm just preaching Jesus. And let me tell you, it's impossible to preach Jesus without repentance. Because Jesus Jesus preached repentance. Jesus taught repentance of our future sins because they're not under the blood until they're repented for. Listen, I'm going to hear it again. We, can't, we, say, we say things like, you know, you know, God helps those who help themselves. Second Confusions 2, 2, 2. What? No, no, no. Take the 21 day challenge. My God, read your Bible. <laughs> well, brother, it's all under the blood. That depends. Did you repent for it? Come on, we're talking about eternity and what we're doing is we're dancing with eternity. So here's, here, I, 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 here, here's what I call it, okay? The fall from grace Deception is the fall from grace, and I call it graceception. It's the deception of a false grace. A few more scriptures and we're done. Hebrews 10.26. Okay, I will obey. Hebrews 10.26. If we, because I'm breaking, I'm breaking strongholds of the mind right now. If we deliberately keep on sinning, is it up on the screens? Look at this. This is not me. This is not clever. I don't have stories and poems for you. Just scripture. If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. Can I read it one more time? If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of truth, there's no sacrifice for sin left. Watch. This is, this is Hebrews, okay? This is New Testament. This is under grace. Only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Let's go down to verse 29. It says, who has treated an unholy thing in the blood of the covenant and sacrificed them? Who has insulted the spirit of grace? And let me help all the Facebook theologians that think that Jesus was just taught or Paul was just talking to uh, the Jews. And that drives me nuts. Okay. If it's in the Bible, he's talking to us. Oh, no, no, no. He was only talking to the Israelites when he said, don't murder. Like that makes sense. If we knowingly keep on sinning, then I heard, I heard this preacher drove me nuts. Famous preacher. He said, Mocking, making fun of it, mocking the scripture, mocking it, saying oh, willful sin. All sin is willful. That's a lie from the pit of hell. All sin is not willful. Do you know why they have different kinds of murder? They have different kinds of murder because one murder is premeditated. And one murder didn't mean to, but I did it. Watch, didn't plan on it. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't plan out, but it happened, okay? I, I, I can tell you personally, I have tried at times to say I'm not going to sin, but I've fallen and made mistakes because the Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. So let me tell you the difference. There's a difference between willful sin and, 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 unre, and, and unwillful sin. Here it is. Willful sin, here this church, is unrepented sin. That you willfully continue after you know that you have sinned against God. And you say stuff like, oh, I'm under grace. You don't have to worry about it. Ephesians 4.30, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you have been sealed for the days of redemption. All right, we're going to close up with this. If I could just have that piano player that plays like 20 instruments, just go on the piano. 
The most dangerous thing about deception is this. You don't have to play anything yet. I know you can play like 20 things at once, but just wait. I'll give you the, I'll give you the nod, the wink. The craziest thing about deception is that you don't know you're deceived until the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. So you can go thinking you're right for so long and be self-deceived. Remember when David was, uh, Nathan came and confronted him and about the story of the lamb and the ewe and all this stuff. And, 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 and Nathan said, who's that man? He deserves to die. Watch, David really believed that that guy deserved to die, but he was really deceived. That's right. Then the prophet said, you're the man. And the Holy Spirit convicted his heart. I'm going to tell you right now, this is what, this is how you remove deception from your life. If you're taking notes, write this down. Deception has taken place when you have lost the fear of the Lord. Here's the last scripture we're going to look at and we're going to close up. Acts chapter 5. Probably the most difficult passage of scripture for the perverted, manipulated, distorted, out of biblical context, grace individuals to dance around is Acts chapter five. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And you know the story. Uh, let, me, you, let me just read it real fast just in case you don't. I don't want to assume you do. It says, a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept a part of the money for himself. He brought the rest to the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is Satan? Uh, I skipped a part. I'm sorry. If you go on to read it, 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 he lied about the money. He said, this is the full amount, and he didn't have to lie, but he lied, and there was no reason. He didn't owe the money, but he lied of free will. In verse 3, Peter said, how is Satan so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? You have kept some for yourself and you received the land. Didn't it belong to God? After you had sold it, wasn't it all yours at your disposal? What made you think doing such a thing? You have not lied to just a human being, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. His wife came in and the very same scenario happened. And I heard, I, I heard uh, pastors trying to give a reasoning for why, because the great question is, is they're under grace, they lied to the Holy Spirit and God killed them. That's what happened. So, so how do you figure this out in the all future sins are under grace bubble? How, how, do you, how do you interpret this? And they say this. This is the only example that they could give. They give the example or they give the, the, the reasoning that they weren't real believers, that they were wolves in sheep's clothing that snuck in among them. The problem with that, I go back to my go-to little phrase here, is where's the scripture that says that? There's not one scripture that says that. In fact, you can go find other scriptures where Peter's talking about a man among you named Ananias. So actually, on the contrary, there's more evidence to prove that they were there. If they were wolves in sheep's clothing, they would be stealing money from the church, not giving money free will to the church. But overall, more than anything, let me tell you why you know that this was God involved. They were believers, and this was grace being abused because they lied to the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of grace. Verse 11, it says this. Put it up on the screens. Verse 11. And it says this. Great fear sees the whole church who heard about these events. Watch this. Somehow, in the familiarity of dealing with the apostles, somehow, in the familiarity of life and the relationship with the Lord, watch, they lost the fear of the Lord. And they begin to lie to the Holy Spirit. And what did he say? He said, Peter said, how has Satan filled your heart? Listen, if you are believing the lie of this extreme, manipulated, unbiblical grace, you're at the point where Satan can now enter your heart. And here's what happened is when they came and they died, the Bible says the result was great fear sees the church. Now, if they're in wolves and sheep clothing, wouldn't the church be excited? Wouldn't the church be like, yeah, mess with us, boom. <laughs> Why were they afraid? Because I bet you some other people lost the fear of God. And that's how great deception came into their life. Listen, people drop off when they fear the, lose the fear of the Lord. People fall 
off when they lose their fear of God. Last scripture and we're done. Luke, all right, go to verse 12. And here's where we're ending with. You can uh, play that, that oh, 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 holy, holy that we end with song. It says this, verse 12. It says the, the apostles perform, verse 12, many signs and wonders among the people. And the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Verse 14, nevertheless, more and more men Men believed in the Lord and were added to their number daily. Let me tell you what happens with this remnant that's chosen by grace. When the fear of God returns to the house of God, go ahead and start playing that. When the fear of God returns to the house of God, that's when you're going to see more and more miracles. That's when you're going to see more and more signs and wonders. That's when you're going to see more and more added daily. I'm telling you right now, the reason why this remnant it rising is the beginning of a movement. The reason why, Pat, you saw a wave begin to sweep over America was because it was a wave of his power. It was a wave of his presence. Pat, why? I feel the Holy Ghost, Pat. Pat, why do you think you were afraid when you saw the dream? Because you still have the fear of the Lord. And I declare over you, Pat, that's what you're going to impart into this generation is a fear of God who resists the enemy and shuns evil, who who stands for all things pure and all things righteous. This is the remnant rising that God is going to use as a remnant to their generation. Who was the remnant? The remnant was those that did not lose the fear of the Lord. The remnant was those that stood even though everybody else fell away. Those were the ones chosen by grace. The ones that believed God and feared Him. I don't care what you do at this point because I didn't plan up to this moment. But my prayer is, oh God, let me never lose, listen, your holy fear. I'm not talking about being afraid of God. I'm talking about being, being reverent to his holiness. God, I honor you more than the things of this world. God, I honor you more than popularity. Wow. I feel the Holy Spirit right now. Every young person, listen, 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 listen. Every young person that you fear the approval of men in popularity more than you do God. And you say, I'm going to be real about it, but I want to fear God more than people. Run down to this altar as fast as you can. As fast as you can. Maybe you're an adult and that's you too. Run down to this altar. Don't wait. Don't wait. Run down to this altar. I don't care what you do. You can kneel. You can bow. You can lift your hands. It doesn't matter. But this is a moment where you're saying, Lord, I'm going to fear you and shun evil. Listen, every single righteous man of God, read about it. They feared God. They feared God. They feared God because they knew God. Part of knowing God is fearing God. Part of fearing God is knowing God. That's where the relationship is born. That's where the relationship is birthed. That's what's going to happen in this remnant rising. That's what I am remnant is. It's establishing the fear of God back in churches. Pat, I feel it in my spirit. You're going to see miracles happen that are going to bring the fear of God back to God's house. I feel this strongly. Pat, you have felt the challenge, the weight of being challenged. And then you've seen the proof and the result and the fruit, the spiritual fruit of being challenged by God and withstanding the challenge. Pastor Pat, I feel it in my spirit that God is going to place you into very high offices of power where you're not there to be their friend. In fact, all of the friends, wow, here's what I feel in my spirit. I love the Holy Spirit so much. I love Him so much. Here's what I feel in my spirit. I don't know the scripture. You do. But Jesus, there was a dead, oh man, I love the Holy Ghost. There was, there was when, when Jesus was healing the dead, I believe it was the dead girl. And all of the friends of the house were in the house. And they kicked the friends out. And the only one that came in was Jesus with the dead girl. And Jesus healed the dead girl. Watch, his words brought her back to life. Pat, here's what I feel in my spirit prophetically. That there are people of power and of high influence 
that all of their friends are trying to get into the room, but they're dead and their friends can't help them. And all these people are trying to be buddies with them. Watch, Jesus wasn't her buddy. He wasn't her homeboy. He wasn't her friend. He was her savior. Prophet, high priest, and king. Here's what I feel in my spirit. The reason why you're being brought into these rooms is you're being a prophet. And your words are going to bring life to dead spirits. I'm going to ask respectfully that nobody claps anymore for prophetic words. The reason I ask that is that we could just focus on God. Everyone's trying to get to the place of power to enlarge their ministry. They're trying to get to a place of influence so that they can grow and be more influential. Huh. That's why you're a remnant of the prophets, Pat. Because you chose the hard road every time. When there is always an easier road, you chose the hard one every time. The road of faith every time. The road less traveled every time. Why? Because on that narrow road is where you meet Jesus and hear this prophetically. And when you walk into those rooms and when you walk into the box offices and when you walk into the the offices of power, you don't walk by yourself. But it's like the road to Emmaus. Jesus has been with you on the road the entire time. And when you walk into the room, a friend's not walking to the room. A preacher's not walking into the room. An evangelist is not walking to the room. A man who needs something isn't walking to the room. It's not what you need. It's what they need that you have. And you have words of life. And I pray right now that the prophetic voice begins to flow through you. And as it does to children and young people across the nation, from the least to the greatest, a remnant will rise. Father, I pray, let the fear of God come back to America. Let a remnant be established Father, we declare it right now in Jesus' mighty name. I don't know what to do at this point. This is just God's time. Oh, I know what to do right now. This is where we confess our sins. Oh, this is where holy repentance comes upon us. This is, this, is where, this is where we go and sin no more. This is at the feet of Jesus' moment. Why are many of you kneeling? Because at the feet of Jesus, this is where we go and sin no more. This is where we say, Lord, I fear you more than anything. I want you more than anything. I love you more than anything. Like Pat said, prophesied last night, am I not enough? Yes. He said, it. wow, I feel the Holy Spirit, Pat. Last night, you preached a message, which was Jesus meeting this church, this congregation. You said, am I not enough? This morning, my assistant assignment is the assignment of repentance and now we go and sin no more here this is the moment where that girl became the greatest evangelist that her city had ever seen that was the moment where she, her, she was written in the history books for generations and generations as a one who met jesus and was changed supernaturally it wasn't that jesus didn't judge her it was that jesus showed her a righteous judge that taught her his righteousness This is the moment where you repent before your king. Not of future sins. This is where you say, Lord, use me for your glory.